a lot of our coaches take Wednesday afternoon off. It's just a day they really like to take off and we run a flexible schedule um, that allows them to do so. And it's way easier to have a stacked gym of people paying 600 a month and then expand into a group thing where it's like, okay, now it could be 300 if you want than to have a bunch of people paying you 100 a month and then try and figure out a way to sell them a three to $400 a month membership afterward. As any business owner, it doesn't matter what industry you're in, you're, you're in the business of solving someone's problem, right? And one of the key components, and I think one of the mistakes that, that are made in, in most businesses, and I can speak to CrossFit specifically, is sometimes we make up problems so that we can solve them. Hello, and welcome to Gym World Worldwide. I'm joined today with my co-founder and co-host, Mateo Lopez. How are you today, Mateo? I'm good. You know, you and I have been going uh, back and forth. We've been chewing. We've been chewing on this idea of separating the methodology and the business model of CrossFit, right? Yeah. Se- separating it. You mean breaking it down, building it back breaking up? Breaking it down, thinking of them as as different parts, right? Because sure. the CrossFit changed my life. It changed your life. Totally. Uh, TBD for better or for worse, but certainly a lot of change. Who's um, to say? Who's to say? Some, maybe some good, some bad. Uh, but one of the things that we've talked about a lot on this show is that most affiliates are running almost the exact same business model. Even though yeah. there's nothing in the the CrossFit scripture or doctrine that it, the business must be run that way, right? No. There's nothing in the journal. And in fact, CrossFit was run as, you know, a lot of times it was done out of garages. It was done personal training. It was done in small groups. And then eventually large groups where it landed. You and do what so, you want. Just teach yeah, CrossFit. Well, that's it. Well, that's what it felt like, you know, back in the early days, back in, back in the days of the, 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 the motorcycle gang, as uh, some of the OGs call it. We've been talking a lot to people who run small group training gyms and semi-private gyms and, um, we're like, hey, this is a cool model. There's some efficiency there. Maybe like a CrossFit could do that and be successful with it. And it's an um, idea. It is an idea. And 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 I went out, started looking under rocks, started started digging around, trying to find somebody who was doing just that. And under one of the rocks, I found uh, Dan Purrington, who is our wow. guest for today's show, coming at you from his ranch. In, in in Bend, Oregon, from from a top from literally atop the mountain, uh, to talk about the unique way that he is running his CrossFit affiliate, uh, CrossFit Woodslawn. Hello and welcome to Gym World. Hi guys, good morning. Thanks for having me. What an intro! What a lead up! All right. Yeah, yeah. So so tell us a little bit about uh, CrossFit Woodslawn, and more specifically, um, you know. Your your semi private or small group? I for, I forget which one it is exactly. Or so are you large group CrossFit? Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, we're certainly not large group CrossFit. So I, it kind of depends on which circles you run. We we call ourselves semi private, but I think uh, for for clarity, uh, maybe we'll refer to it as as small group just to get a, a better understanding. So we started out as a traditional CrossFit gym in two thousand eight, the end of two thousand eighteen. And so we got one full year of CrossFit in yeah, before the world shut down and it shut down hard. So our, our gym's in Portland, Oregon, and we, we were shut down for a long time, specifically inside. So, um, so we had to kind of pivot our model a little bit. Uh, so the forcing function of COVID turned out to be a really amazing opportunity for us. And that was just because of lockdown or what, you know, like what? Yeah. Yeah. A combination. So the, the mask mandate was very long. So I think we had the one of the longest ones in the country. So we had an indoor mask mandate until March of 2022. So it was a long, long time. And we had, you know, intermittent times that we could be inside. But for the most part, it was outside. When I took the space over, it had been vacant for about two and a half years. And it was a, a real estate office. So really low drop ceilings to hide, you know, HVAC and all. So we have central air and central heat and all the bougie things that your typical warehouse doesn't have. Um, But you got to hide it somewhere. So we had short ceilings, but I took the space because it came with 28 parking spaces. And I had no idea how valuable that was going to turn out to be. When COVID hit, the mandates in my area were very 
ambiguous. And so we didn't have clarity on what we could do, how we could train. So we essentially, we brought people back into the parking lot and we built these cast iron wheelie things that we could wheel all of our equipment out onto the sidewalk. And we gave people a parking space and then we had a parking space that separated them and then another parking space. So we just started working out in our parking lot. And um, as true Oregonians and as true Oregon weather, it started to change. So um, we needed to figure something out coming into, uh, oh yeah. Boy, that was a day. So for those uh, uh, not watching, I just pulled up a video from his Instagram that looks like it can kind of discern bodies working out in like pitch black. And the post says, this is what crossfitting in a parking lot in during a power outage during the pandemic looks like. So I like the uh, lighting is just from the car headlights. Definitely doesn't, doesn't look or feel like a premium experience to me. (laughs) (laughs) It certainly wasn't, but it was um, in the sense of we didn't let anything stop us. So that was an ice storm that caused that power outage. And we were already outside and those are the boat tents we used to have, which just got crushed, um, you know, partway through the, the late fall, early winter as we were trying to protect athletes, but still trying to protect the business. Cause we, at that stage, weren't allowed to cross the threshold with, with any athletes, but we were such a new business that we really didn't have a choice. And so through that, we started to meet people a lot more in a one-on-one environment where I'd go to their driveway and train them in on their, in their driveway. And so we did, you know, just everything we possibly could think of during that time frame. And then as we started to come back in, um, people, they were still a little hesitant and, and they were, one of the big things we noticed is they were very out of shape, very deconditioned more so than we had ever seen, you know, in past times. And, and what they really needed was a, a lot of accountability and a lot of focused attention. They didn't need to be thrown in. And, and our classes are capped at 12. So we don't have huge classes, A, based on space, but B, based on um, we live in a really expensive area and we need to be able to charge a premium just to operate. And in order to do that, we recognized very early there had to be a lot of value in coaching. And... I'm sure there are some some amazing coaches out there can that can coach 30 person classes and give a world class experience that's worth everything but we found that it was much much higher value to keep our class size at 12. And that's for group just to be clear. Yeah, so that's so our CrossFit classes are capped at 12 except for on the weekends when we run partner workouts and we do 16. Now when we do Murph or something like that we have we we open the cap up a little bit more but um on your day to day that's the way it works. I know we're going to get into the different services and the pricing and the model, but how do you, what is the actual space? Do you have multiple rooms or mm-hmm. it's just, okay, so what is the breakdown? Yeah. So uh, we'll start from the outside space. So we still have the, we, we erected the um, full outdoor pavilions that ha- now have, you know, stationary pull-up bars and, and squat racks mounted outside. And we've got, it's probably 12 or 1400 square feet of, usable space outside. And that's what saved us during COVID. My inside space, I have probably 1200 square feet of usable in my first space. The the building itself is 2000, but equipment storage, offices, bathrooms, showers, the whole shebang takes up a lot of space. And then my newest space, which is just, we blew a hole in the wall. So we just have a single door. Um, That space is uh, a little under a thousand square feet, but again, two offices equipment. We, we have 670 square feet total. So you're looking at 2000 square feet of inside space with the combined. Did you have both of those initially, or did you grow into that second? No. So the, the gentleman next door, oh yeah, that was before we had anything. Um, the gentleman next door, uh, owned a dry cleaning, uh, facility and they didn't make it through COVID. So we had to, jump through the hoops of getting that place specked out and getting it decommissioned and everything. Um, but we were in a good position to be able to, to take that on about uh, probably 18 months ago. You said you had showers. What was the cost of the build out when you guys first opened and then the cost of converting the next door space? Uh, so the cost of the build out was somewhere around $30,000. Uh, I can't remember exactly. And then our pavilions here were, 
Well, they were a lot more expensive. So the, the, the roofing is actually what everybody was using out here for like to build outside spaces. Well, so and wood also, wood was like really expensive during oh, that man, time. So expensive and just hardware, just in yeah. general, like the, 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 the mounts that mounted to the ground was expensive. Um, the outside space was probably just material, probably about 15,000. Uh, and that doesn't include mats and equipment and everything out there. The second space that we had to get decommissioned and everything, that one was expensive, you know, cause we had to have a special, um, uh, dry cleaning, uh, hazmat team come in and just make sure everything was okay. And that cost a lot of money and took a lot of time. I mean, we possessed the space for six or seven months before we had a single athlete in there and we had to take yeah, it all Jim down. Owner. Don't buy yeah. uh don't buy or lease a, a dry cleaner, uh previous dry <laughs> yeah. cleaner. There's a red tape that's universal. That's not just uh yeah over on the West Coast. That is everywhere. It is a miserable it, idea. So Yeah, yeah. We fortunately he was green for about twelve years. So he had had everything out of there beforehand, which was nice, but we still went the the full route and had it checked out by a, a company. So that one was probably in excess of 25,000 as well. Again, absent, um, absent equipment and things Plus like that. Plus paying rent for seven months, right? Yeah. So we were paying rent. Um, and then, um, uh, we have an amazing relationship with, with our landlord. I started a legend 65 plus program about three weeks into opening our facility five and a half years ago. And he and his wife have been in it. They're both North of 85. Um, and they've been in it since, since day one. And so we have an amazing working relationship. And so we were able to, to work together during COVID, uh, but we had a pretty, pretty hefty lease increase, um, about a year and a half ago to make up for, for COVID and all the extra, again, we live in an expensive County and, and, um, taxes kind of get, get added every year. And so we took on a pretty heavy burden of lease increase um, in in addition to taking on that space. All right. I asked about how you spent all your money. Now John can ask how you make all your money. All right. So we, we know what it costs to build your gym. Uh, what um, it's still not clear. So you moved everyone outside during COVID. How much, it, how much of your recurring revenue went away? When we moved outside? Yeah, like when you got during the initial lockdown, like from peak to trough, how much you're like, what'd you go from to where you where'd you end up at the bottom? I lost one member during COVID. During COVID. Yeah. So $185 per month. Okay. And then we actually grew during COVID. And then you said COVID was a forcing function. Well, so the forcing function doesn't sound financial. What was the forcing function? How did how did you end up doing semi private training? That's what I, I don't understand the pivot here. Yeah, totally. So um, I didn't accept, and this this may not have been the a smartest business business uh, decision, but I decided not to accept any financial resources in order to force me to to grow and start to talking to people. And so right when COVID hit, just like, uh, and we weren't with Two Brain at that time, but we we were following them, and just like they talked about, um, we made contact with our athletes every single day and and whatnot, and that really helped. But even those athletes, when they started coming back, they wanted smaller group environments. And so we were able to pivot and offer fitness, even though it was outside under our pavilion within the guidelines of what Multnomah County, which is where the gym is. Um, and so we could provide a service that, um, that no one else in the area could provide, um, at least, you know, uh, under the, under the mandates. And, we had always had an on-ramp and, and, and it has been under multiple iterations since then. And we were finding that people wanted a little bit more attention. And once that got out that we were able to provide that, um, we started getting more and more people. And so I couldn't find any, um, private training coaches that, that were really solid at that time. I had two very good ones in Tyler and Anna who are still with me. Anna's our nutrition coach and Ty's our director of training and our in-house physical therapist. Um, and so we needed to start turning away potential members, um, for both the on-ramp and private training. And you guys know, as gym owners, if you're turning away private training, there's a problem. 
Um, and so that spawned the idea of, okay, we're going to put our private training clients into this semi-private. And so we built it out um, in this eight-week format. They meet twice a week. They were focusing specifically on stuff that you would normally do in private training. And so we threw that out in our in our um, to our email list. In our email list, I I talk to um, very organically two to three times a week. We have a an, an email that goes out every Sunday at four o'clock, and it hasn't missed in five and a half years. Like has not missed on that Sunday, and that's been valuable. We got responses for a bunch of people that were in our CrossFit classes that wanted to join the semi privates. And this was two and a half years ago. And we're like, oh, that's interesting. Maybe it's just a fluke. And so we opened up another one literally a week later and we filled that one. And we were filling it with people that were doing CrossFit, but they didn't want to, they didn't want to get rid of their CrossFit membership. They just wanted more specific strength work. They wanted to slow some things down. They wanted a smaller environment. Um, and so we just started to build from there. Um, and we weren't doing you know, power clean, snatches, handstand push-ups, ring muscle-ups, double unders, you know, all the things that when we think about the the typical skill sessions that we see kind of in in the four four walls of a CrossFit gym, we were doing hip thrusts and uh, bent over rows and, you know, pull-up progressions and, and bench press blocks and dumbbell bench press blocks and, and walking lunge blinds. So very like more of like functional bodybuilding. Um, and so we started to talk about that more and more in our social media and in our, in our emails. And most specifically, we would talk to people in classes that we had identified, like, this would be a really great thing for you. Maybe you struggled with low back pain when you deadlifted, or maybe you had some significant knee injury when you were squatting or things of that nature and, and being able to provide that focused attention and that, that specialty training for these folks in, you know, again, a small group format. So our semi-privates are six people um, with a little bit of a decreased cost because they pay less than they do in a, in a private training session, but they still get to be around their friends. They still, still get to work out really hard. And we, um, we still have them come to the CrossFit classes. So fast forward till now, it's a much more curated experience where um, we have, anywhere between eight and 12 semi-private blocks running at a time. Um, some of them are specialty. Like we have a cycling specific one. We just finished ski season. So we did two months or two blocks of, you know, ski specific ones. But for the most part, it's squats and hip thrusts and deadlifts. Um, and so we're, we're working that in and, and at least half of the people that are in our semi-privates are in our CrossFit classes um, as well. So let's let's break down what percentage of your revenue comes from each of the streams. Like how many? What percentage is group training? What percentage is uh, semi private? And then do you have a personal training business as well? Yeah. So our so our personal training uh, business is is um, evolving. We really don't do any more one on one training. We just don't have the the square foot. We don't have the, and I don't want to grow my, my coaching base. So everybody starts in a one-on-one -on -one environment, but we're getting them into the two-on-one, three-on-one training, or we're getting them into the semi-private. And so on any given month, depends on how the, the semi-privates are rotating, but we're on average, I would say we're in the mid to upper 30% come from our CrossFit membership. So ongoing membership. And then, you know, the remainder minus about six or 7%, which we do in nutrition comes from, you know, semi-private and then, um, our, uh, our hybrid program. So our two on one or our three on one training. So basically the majority of your revenue, it's yeah. grown into, yep. it's grown into something much larger than your, your just group training base is what you're, what you're saying. Oh, hundred percent. And that growth is what's allowed us to grow our staff, to be completely honest. So like I, the reason that that we are able to have a a super diverse staff, but also have you know multiple people that their sole income comes from working in the fitness industry, and and it's not a small income, um, is because we can allow them to specialize and we can allow them to to earn an hourly rate that in some cases is three times of what we can afford to pay them for a general class, and so um, 
business model wise, it really stabilizes the business in my in my business to be able to do that. And how did this impact your top line from like how much has your business grown from going 100 percent group to what it is now? So we'd always done a little bit of private training and I mean small amounts and not including, you know, our on ramp, which has always been private training. But we I would say about triple when we were doing um, just exclusively group and that was it. We were mid to upper teens and now we're where we average mid fifties and we, we play with 60, we missed 60 in January by $700, which was like, ah, oh, we we're that close. Um, so it, it's pretty significant. Yeah. And mid, to, like that level is literally the average based off of our data and two brain state of the industry, somewhere in the neighborhood of like 12 to 15 is what the average CrossFit's bringing home. And then it just sounded like you just went on a, on a hockey stick ride, like how, how long did it take you to get there? Has it just been kind of a, a, a slow grind up or was there just a huge inflection when you started testing out these, um, these semi-private sessions? I think, um, when we really got our, our, our on-ramp and our sales process dialed in a couple of years ago is when we really started to see a fast climb, um, to, to present day where we control the amount of people coming in probably took two, two and a half years to get systems and processes and operations in line where that I could, I could have staff doing other things without having to check in with me. So I could focus on sales process or what's our, what's our uh, prospect journey look like, or what's our marketing funnel doing now, or, or what do we need to add to the on-ramp? So, you, you know, you can't evaluate all those things. If you're coaching 25 classes, 30 classes a week, which is what, you know, the story of every CrossFit gym owner, the first couple of years they own. And so once we got, you know, operations and systems in place and got coaches trained on this standardized process, then it freed us up to start to build. Um, and even in this year, we've seen a growth in, in over the last nine or 10 months, I put someone in place that is now runs as our operation manager. And that has allowed us to grow just because he deals with a lot of the day-to-day, the the beginning stages of how we interact um, on GLN with them, because we're very, very quick to respond to people. And that frees me up to to analyze the way our on-ramps go. We're 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 piloting a, a specific semi-private and, and private training on-ramp right now that's going really well, but it was created because I was able to create time by creating a position. So That's when we grow is when we create time through creating a position. And listeners, uh, GLM stands for Gym Lead Machine. It is a website and marketing automation tool that uh, Dan bought right around that inflection point when he went from 50 and just shot up to 60. There is, it it was, uh, yeah, one one of the tools that helped him get there and free up a little time. So if you're interested in learning more about that, why don't you just go to uh, usekilo.com and watch the demo video with Mateo's face. Now back to the show. Um, I mean, even more with that though, like that platform has allowed us to do organic marketing to a level we've never been able to do. And when you're running a program that you want to engage your group classes with, you absolutely have to have that. And so more of a, more of a deliberate plug for that, like that CRM platform has been, has been amazing since we, we integrated it. Well, I have good news for you, Dan, because (laughs) my friend Mateo Lopez has been stressed out. He came to my house at nine o'clock last night. Um, He was frazzled. And uh, it was because he made his he made salsa too spicy. He came over. He's like, uh-huh. I made you some salsa, which he didn't. He just ruined some salsa and gave me the ruined salsa. Oh, um, but, it, but it was it was very oh. like to, to your wife's palate. You know, I thought it was very yeah, delicious. Yeah, I've had, great. I, yeah, it was great. salsa. Yeah, yeah, turned yeah. Out I, I don't want to know. I failed, makes very good I'm, salsa. I failed in my household, but in John's household, I succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> I got I got Tao's wife's sloppy seconds. Um, yeah, yep. There you go. And, and I'm like, you know, why do you make this salsa too hot, Tao? And he's like, I've just been so stressed out. I've just been pacing up and down in my office for the last week trying to figure out this one feature 
that is going to be a tremendous unlock for gym owners who primarily do uh, semi-private training. And he said he he had the Eureka moment, right? Was it last night or, or the night before when the Eureka moment hit? Uh, yeah, it's been like a 48 hour Eureka. It's been building, yeah. you know, this uh, climax. Congratulations. Really been building. And, and, yeah. and, and that's going to be dropping. That's going to be dropping early May. We're going to, yeah. we'll, we'll let you peek behind the scenes. I just want to tease it here, but, but, the, but the, the boys, Love the boys it. been in the lab cooking and we got some tools that are going to free up your life a little bit more, but, um, let's talk about staffing, right? Cause you, you like, we talked to a guy named Chris Travis, who runs a gym called uh, Seattle Strength and Performance, and um, he runs all uh, semi-private. That's the only thing he offers, and he did 100% salaried, and his gyms ran at a similar size to ours when we were operating, so they were in the neighborhood of, like, I think his smallest one was doing 600 grand, his largest one was doing 900 grand. Um, but he was able to operate at that size. So, so similar to you as well. Um, and he was able to operate that size with just full two full-time people. And he salaried them both and offered them great benefits. And, and we tried to do that. It didn't really work well for us because what we realized is between like having on ramp and all the classes, we had like almost triple the amount of offering, like triple the amount of sessions he had. And so we needed at a minimum four full-time coaches. And so the, you know, the business couldn't support a wide enough salary gap to compensate the best performers in the business versus the worst. So I'd be curious to know how many sessions are you guys doing and how many uh, staff members are required to fulfill all those sessions? Yeah. I mean, so the, the sessions are changing a little bit because we're continuing like, to pivot our, our one-on-one training to two-on-one and three-on-one. Um, but we're, you know, some days we're going to run 15 to 20 private training sessions per day, not including our semi-privates as well, plus the six classes plus on-ramps. Um, and so some days are going to be a little bit more anemic than others. Um, and that's just by choice with the coaches. They would, a lot of our coaches take Wednesday afternoon off. It's just a day they really like to take off and we run a flexible schedule, um, that allows them to do so. Um, and so we have, I mean, I'll start from the top. My, my head coach and my director of training, he also, uh, is our in-house physical therapist and, and uh, we built that physical therapy clinic together, which integrates within the gym. Um, and we sold him that practice last year. Um, so he gets all of his income from, from the space. Uh, then we have our nutrition coach. She has 20 to 25 nutrition clients. Plus she does the majority of our, our semi privates in the evening. And then she's got another book of, uh, private training clients, whether they be one-on-one or two-on-one. Uh, so she's quite busy. We have our operations director, uh, Jonathan. He does our operations about 12 hours a week for that. And then he runs our on-ramp program where every single on-ramp comes in, does their first on-ramp session with him, and then he matches them up with two of our other coaches. Um, he also does about half of our no sweat intros and about half of our goal reviews, which if you're not doing goal reviews, you better. Um and, uh, and then he has, a uh, two semi privates that he runs as well. And then we have, uh, another coach who does the majority of our two on ones, three on ones, and our four on ones. He also works a lot with our youth, um, uh, sports athletes in the area. And, uh, and then we have, uh, our final coach who coaches the most, um, uh, the most group classes. He's also our facilities and maintenance manager. So we don't sub out any of our cleaning or uh, facilities maintenance. We added that on and checked with him, say, Hey, if this is something you're interested in, I'm outsourcing it currently, we can give you more of a full-time position to build this out. And he was uh, equally as excited about that. Um, and then we have uh, two bench coaches, um, one that's on maternity leave and then another one that fills in um, as well as he does some of our sugar wad social media um, on day to day. He's a really amazing writer. So. Uh, that's the makeup of our team. And then I do a couple of semi-privates during the week. I coach a, a 5 a.m. CrossFit class on Wednesdays because I really I miss coaching. And then I have, uh, I think, three private training clients that are all small business owners. 
that I get to hang out with. And that's why I train them is because I'm like, Hey, these guys are cool. And I like talking to them. And, um, and then outside of that, I, I run the business and then, uh, spend a lot of time on the, the, you know, mentoring team, both for my team, but also for other gyms. I'm still having a tough time envisioning how you fit all this. <laughs> you yeah. have your 12 person classes, your small group, six person classes, you're sometimes four, sometimes three, sometimes two on one classes or sessions. And then you have your one on one on ramps. And then you have your PT. Where's all this? And then you're sitting down with people to do nutrition coaching and you're sitting down with people to go reviews and you're sitting down with people to do no sweat. So where does all this fit in this tiny little, but also a little bit laundry room space? So, I mean, it's systems and operations, right? So we built the nutrition program to start kind of from there. When I built it initially, I built it on an online platform. And this is before Zoom was cool. And I don't know if Zoom's cool anymore, but whatever. We do most of our nutrition outside of the first consultation Zoom. So that frees up a little bit of space. As far as the training, so like Monday mornings, we will always have a full 6 a.m. class. I have a full six-on-one semi-private. There's a four-on-one that happens, plus we have an on-ramp. And so it's just logistics. So we have logistics of when this happens, we go here. So in the second room, this goes here. In the first room, this goes here. If we need to pivot to use outside, we do this. And so we can do 20, 22 to 25 people you know, at a time with five to six coaches working because we have it planned out. And that's taken a lot. Like the way that I built out the second room was, you know, I put certain squat racks that were folding in different places so that it made a natural line in the room so that we could do, you know, three on one and four on one training over here and do six on one training over here with our, we, we kind of copied some of the model in our, in our 12 on one where we, um, we always pair athletes up. So it's fewer people for the coaches to coach so we can get more coaching. And we just move that over into the semi-private world. When you're doing strength training, you're not moving the whole time, right? You, you inherently are going to have 90 minutes to, or 90 seconds to three minutes of rest. And so it's just controlling that and really being able to, captivate your audience, hold their attention and give them direction, which you guys have coached adults. You would think it's easy, but it's not, especially once they become friends, then it's really hard. Um, and so we have done a lot of mocks. We've done a lot of role play. We've done a lot of, uh, of mess ups and, and learn from them. And we, we do, uh, iterations. And now, um, if you want to start a semi-private or if you want to start a, a two-on-one or a three-on-one and you notice there's a bottleneck, then you come into my office and we pull up the whiteboard and we draw it up and see if it works there. Um, and then we go through like that. But um, again, all of that can't happen if you don't have other people that know how to do your consults or your goal reviews or you're coaching your classes and, and things like that. So it's uh, it has a natural flow to it that works, works really well. You labeled like a 50 people for the staff. What was the actual number? What was the total number of staff members? It was, it seemed like a lot. Let me see. So if you count me, Tyler, Anna, Jonathan, Sam, Brandon, James, and Hannah's a bench coach. So we have eight. So a lot, that's a lot of bodies for, uh, yeah. So some complexity, some complexity in this model. And how many of them uh, get their full-time income from your business? Six. All right. So you're running six full-time and then the two bench coaches. Mm -hmm. Got it. And, that in, and that's including you. Correct. Yep. All right. So if you are, you, you work, you're a two brain mentor. You mentioned that earlier that you advise other gym owners. Um, we did a podcast, you and I together on for two brain. Um, you just did Savon's podcast. So people have been reaching out to you probably with the exact same questions that you're answering here, which is how do I do what you did with my CrossFit gym? I want to go from the teens to 60,000 a month. I want to sell semi-private training. Um, how do you coach people through it? Well, how, how would you advise someone? Because a lot of people understand the model. They see the value. They want to try it. It just seems like 
incredibly difficult to to get it spun up and going. And if I can interject here, because I I want I'm excited for this answer. I want to also just briefly come back to something you said earlier, which is when we were going through and seeking business advice when we had the gyms, what was kind of the rhetoric back then was like, yeah, you're going to take all the complex stuff that's in CrossFit and use that as a selling point. Like, look how hard this muscle up is that you've been struggling with. How about I sell you a personal training session so we can just focus on that really complex thing? And it sounds like from what you said earlier, that's not really your approach to getting people into semi-private or one-on-one uh, training. So yeah, if, if someone's getting started, as John said, how do how do you position this to your to your members and then to the outside people as well? Yeah, that's a that's a great uh, segue into this because it, it really matters. And so when as any business owner, it doesn't matter what industry you're in, you're you're in the business of solving someone's problem, right? And one of the key components, and I think one of the mistakes that that are made in in most businesses, and I can speak to CrossFit specifically, is sometimes we make up problems so that we can solve them. And they're not really the problem. Like what's someone's problem that's not going to the games that can't do a ring muscle up? I mean, what are they actually trying to get out of that, right? I mean, if that's what they really want to do, awesome. In my experience, the majority of the population think that's a really cool thing to do. But what I'd really like to do is squat without discomfort. Or I'd like to get a little bit uh, have a little bit more skeletal muscle mass, a little bit body fat, a little bit less body fat. And so the first thing that I talk to people, and so, yeah, since the podcast that I did with John, um, I definitely have uh, spent a lot of time fielding questions. Uh, I just gave away our on-ramp to the, to the uh, two brain group. Uh, and right now I'm up to, I gave away 60, I sent out 60 emails in three days for all the people for, for our model that we, because in two brain, you guys know you share everything. Like that's just the, that's the deal. Like that, that's the really cool thing about it. But when I talk to people, the first question I'm going to have is like, tell me about your no sweat intro. And then the second question I'm going to have, which is a consultative process for those of you who don't know, where you don't, you don't let someone come into your gym without sitting down and understanding why they're there. Cause again, to go back to creating problems to solve versus solving the person that's in front of you's problem. Um, you're going to do significantly better if you solve their problem, not create one that you may or that they may or may not have. And we do that through a consultative process. And all the goal, re- all goal review is, is in 90 days, you sit down and have the same conversation, but now they've been in your program. And so it's like, you know, I'm here to celebrate your successes, but I'm also here to chat with you about how's this level of accountability been? How have you been progressing? How are you feeling? Have you had a change in goal? Do we need to change your prescription? Do we need to add nutrition? Do we need to stop doing high intensity and add a little bit more strength training? Things of that nature. It's not uncommon for us to change people's uh, change people's prescriptions. Most often, it's adding things because they're all of a sudden doing things that they never thought possible, right? And so you're 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 talking to them. And then the third question is going to be, uh, tell me about your on ramp. Tell me about how I come into your program. Because again, um, if you're looking to pivot to have more private training and more semi-private or whatnot, yet you're putting people into group classes without doing any of those, you're inherently saying, well, this is what we do and this is how we do it. And now you're trying to backdoor sell something they've actually never had experience in. And so... I think that's one of the reasons our on ramp has been so so popular for people to look at is we we like having a, a group model with CrossFit. I, I love the methodology. I like the community side of it. Our athletes love it. And so when we bring people in, we do a private training session each week for six weeks, and then we get them into a little bit of classes with movements that we've covered in the on ramp. So they're going back and forth, back and forth. What really works with that? is we get to save people who say CrossFit's not for me. And we catch them right around session three or four. We're like, I don't, I just don't like the group classes or I don't think I'm ever going to want to snatch or whatever. I'm like, fantastic. Let's pivot you into our semi-private model now, or let's pivot you into, you know, our our private training exclusive model. And so those are going to be my questions is tell me about your consultative process. Tell me about your goal review process. So how are you measuring how, how your program's working for these people? And then tell me, tell me about how much someone gets into your program. So essentially your on ramp, those three things are really, really important to kind of set the foundation of, 
of being successful in the semi-private small group training world um, in my experience. So we talk to a lot of people who who run small group and semi-private gyms. And one of the things that they do that's different and one of the things that we kind of like talking through it with them realized was an impediment is the on-ramp process. So a lot of these guys, their acquisition systems an LBO. So they'll get people in, try the sauce, and then try and upsell them through, you know, anywhere between a two-week to a four-week trial. Um, where, where you really can't do that if you have a structured on-ramp process um, because the cost of fulfillment is so expensive. So like, why, how do you think about your on-ramp and how do you do it when like, if you have this small group training infrastructure, couldn't you, and you're not doing super complex movements in there, couldn't you just throw them into there and then have them graduate in the group after a certain amount of classes or time spent in the gym and uh, like remove a lot of complexity from the business? Theoretically, you could. And one of the reasons that we're, so we're trialing the, the, a different um, private training on-ramp currently is even then when you're having somebody come into a semi-private environment, if they've never touched a barbell before, you're going to still have to spend a lot more time with them than the other five people, even when you break it up, even when you're pairing them up. And so it does, it does dilute their experience as well. And so the virtuosity and the integrity of, of our program requires this barrier of entry. And, and that's how we can um, articulate the value of like, you're going to come in and people are going to be generally where you are. They're going to be generally versed in these movement patterns so that we can equally focus attention um, in that capacity. The, as far as like the sales process of like bringing people in, you know, where, Oh, I just want to try it or whatever. That really starts back when we talk about that prospect journey of like, you have to be continually telling people about the value of your program, about what they're going to get. And one of the big things that we do super well is we talk about how we develop our coaches. So we run, uh, every single third Thursday of the month, we run a, an hour long coaches development run by our head coach. Um, to advance our coaches skill set time over time. And we tell potential members, we tell current members about how we're evolving. We do continuing education credits um, based on how many classes you coach. We give you that much money at the end of the year to spend on that to go advance your, your skill set. And so by articulating that value of what you're getting, um, it, it really allows people to be confident when they come in and you say, well, this is what it is to start. Like we don't do free trials and we don't do things like that. Um, yeah. So it's, it's not just being good at sales for us at least. So are people still finding you because they're looking for CrossFit? Are you still advertising that you're offering CrossFit and then you're selling people first into your unlimited CrossFit package or what is the offer that's attracting people and how are you kind of positioning yourself to new, new members? So we rarely get someone that comes in looking for CrossFit. Um, and we, we have a couple of gyms around us that are a little bit more competitive in the CrossFit space. So if I get somebody that comes into me and is, wants to be competitive CrossFit, I don't, I often don't accept them as a member. I say, Hey, you should go over here. This is what you're looking for. Um, People that are coming into us are reading our Google reviews um, more often than not. So the way it works is like someone either jumps on, goes to our website and does no sort of intro. They do it in seven days or they do it in like 200. Like that's, <laughs> it's weird. Like that's just nice. kind of the way it goes. Um, and so they're, the, the way that we understand it is they drive by, um, they Google us and they go to our uh, Instagram or or website, or maybe they go back and forth. And so they start reading about what we offer. They start seeing who our members are because we're not posting pictures of ripped hands. We're posting pictures of like today's picture is of a 60 year old woman who increased her sumo deadlift from 115 to 170. She had never touched a barbell. Like that is who we are celebrating on there. Last week we, we celebrated um, one of our local teachers that's ridiculously strong. And so, we're we're promoting the people that that we want to come into that space. And oftentimes during our no sweat intro, people are saying, Well, I'm really intimidated by CrossFit because, you know, of all the things that I've seen on social media. But 
the reviews that you have, the emails that you send, and what I'm seeing on your social media suggests that you guys are a little bit different. Tell me about that. Um, so that's how people come come and find us. Yeah, there you go. So, so basically, yeah. so what you're saying, you position yourself as this is an accessible, welcoming, fun, non-intimidating place to try CrossFit. Correct. Yep. And yep. the advantage of that is you get people from all wakes and walks of life, and you're going to have a clientele that's more receptive to getting a little more coaching, paying for expertise. Yeah. Yeah. And and we talk about that. No sort of intro. Like we are a coaching facility. It's something that we, we really hit on in the no sweat intro of like, this is not a do it on your own facility. We don't have open gym. We don't allow any open gym. We allow people to come in and do their specific like warm ups and primers and things like that. If there's space. Um, but we are absolutely positioned as a coaching gym. And that's how, how I talk about us in our emails, in our social media, when I'm talking about the coaches development we do. And so what, um, like people are buying on ramp, like how are, what is the average thing people buy when they come to the gym? Like what, what, are, what are you selling them? So right now you can only come in two ways. Um, and so one of our, is our, our, uh, on ramp to get you into group classes. So that one's four ninety nine. that's six one-on-one -on -one sessions that, in, that includes some classes during that six weeks, nutrition consult, in body scan, 90 day goal review. And then the second way to come in is if you come in looking for private training or semi-private, then we put you into our um, semi-private and private on-ramp. And this is something I built. Uh, it's been running for about four months. We've got, we put 15 people through it. So I've got just about enough where I can really analyze what needs to go. That's 12 one-on-one -on -one sessions. They meet twice a week. Similar nutrition consult, hidden body scan. Um, they get a walking plan and then some at home workouts based on what they have at home. So we want them to be moving three to four days a week. Um, and then of the 15, we've, we've moved everybody into um, either three on one sessions or semi privates coming out of that. And they've, in that program, they're covering, you know, hip thrust squats shoulder to overhead, uh, and, and deadlift. So they're ready to go into wherever they want to go. And that one's uh eight and that's it. You get two, two options, unless you're, you're really experienced in CrossFit. We do a, a three trial pass, but that said a significant portion of the people that have had CrossFit still do our on-ramp. Cause the first question we ask is tell us about the on-ramp you had at your last gym. And oftentimes they have never had one. And so we tell them about it and they're like, oh, that's pretty awesome. I'm going to get some specialty focus. It's also a way for them to understand like, this is how we do it here. Um, and so um, we just make it really simple to, we don't, we don't do a la carte. It's like, this is how you do it because we know this is what works for the avatar that we're looking for, or sorry, for the, the, uh, the population that we've identified who we serve. So it, uh, sorry, just for clarification, do you have, is it one, is it a, it's not custom programming for those six people though, right? It's, it's like everyone's doing a program for eight weeks. Yep. So it's the same program for the six people with the same coach. It oftentimes runs a, a progressive overload because we're going to do either strength training or, or hypertrophy training. Um, and sometimes we, we tell them like these eight weeks, we're going to do some hypertrophy training. And then the next eight weeks, we're going to do strength training because people don't leave the semi-privates. That makes it a lot easier for the coach in that um, they're only doing one program. So they're writing 16 workouts. Now, people might be doing a different progression of that movement. Sometimes we have someone back squat versus front squat or vice versa, um, depending upon, you know, if they have some low back pain or their knee hurts or, or, or things of that nature. But, um, you know, the majority of the time, they're all doing the same thing. And every eight weeks, though, you do have to resell them. I know a lot of people stay, but you kind of have to say, all right, it's ending. Here's the next thing. Confirm you're opting in. And then they opt in again. So that starts week six. Um, and so we have that all outlined where we start to have the conversation of what's next. Um, we talk about this is what we think you should focus on based on what we're seeing and based on the progression of how this would work best. Um, and that, like, for instance, if I, if I am uh, running a bench press block and I see so much uh, asymmetrical bench press where you're like this, I'm like, all right, well, let's work on 
some dumbbell bench press before we go into the next. And so just, just curating their experience. Um, week seven, they get an email that says, Hey, you're coming into retest week, which is week eight. This is what we're going to focus on. Um, you have three days. So building a little scarcity there to, uh, to let us know if you want in. Um, and then we're already softly putting it in our email list of, we have a semi-private coming up. We have one, typically we say one spot available because we haven't got a confirmation from everyone yet. And we know that we're going to get at least five of the six. And why not just have everyone do this? That was my question. It's like, why can you just get rid of group? Or like if you or flip it where it's like if you still want to do the cross, like have everyone do this kind of strength focus block or whatever. And then you sprinkle in some CrossFit testing stuff. I don't know. Why not just have everyone do this? We we absolutely could. But I think um, we like this model in that we get to use some of the, the larger group, you know, the kipping pull-ups or the handstand push-ups or, you know, go fast for this or, you know, here's a benchmark and, and use a rower for this and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, our, and, our, and our clientele base likes that a lot. Um, we do try to keep the cardio and in the, in the intensity down in the semi-privates. Um, but our, our avatar does, does like a community base. Um, and so, um, right now we do it cause it works. Um, the logistics are, are challenging, um, but doable. Um, I'm able to provide a good living for a, a bunch of people and, uh, and I like to do it. Um, I'm not sure if we pivoted everything to semi-private, holy cow, the logistics would be crazy because we would be taking, you know, we probably have 90, 80, 90 people that do CrossFit exclusively. And all of a sudden we've got to pivot all of them and it would just be an absolute nightmare. I was going to phrase it this way because, uh, yeah, the a lot of, a lot of the reluctance we hear about going to this model is the change and change management and dealing with the culture and the existing members, which we've we've owned a bunch of gyms. We've tried to change a bunch of stuff and I get it. Sounds awful. Um, if you were starting from scratch today, do you think you could do offer CrossFit? in a way that would like, uh, you know, do the, the methodology justice and run a really successful business, um, primarily using, not even primarily just using small group or semi-private. I think if you were deliberate, yes. I, I think in the beginning, um, you'd want, if you wanted to run CrossFit classes, um, I think you'd need to build a volume of people first before being able to to niche down i'm saying no classes no classes whatsoever no classes at all yeah can it can there be like a crossfit that does well just offering crossfit but capping four to six yeah yeah absolutely i mean it's gonna i i, I think it'll take a little bit of time um you're gonna really need to be very good at your messaging Right, because most CrossFit gyms are going to run 150 to to 250 a month for an unlimited membership, depending upon where you live. And in the model you're talking about, you're looking at five or six hundred a month. And if you don't have any evidence that this works, and by that I mean social media proof and things of that nature for for prospective clients coming in, the uphill battle will be a little bit greater. Now, that, again, that doesn't mean that it couldn't be done. Um, but I think that would be a, a challenge in the beginning is the general scape that is that is uh, recognized within CrossFit um, would make that challenging. Your boy has done some positioning work, some marketing work in the past. So if you're, if you're someone who wants to do this, um, you know, slide in the DMs because we'd love to, to help you out <laughs> and, and, and make you a case study because this is a thing I think would work and exist. But it seems like the pitch would be pretty straightforward. It's like, hey, you go over there, you're going to get you go to Dan's gym, which is the most boutique gym in the area. You can have 12 people in the class. I got nobody over here. I'm just getting started. But I went to Dan's gym. I'm, I'm one of Dan's old coaches. I know all Dan's stuff. You come here, you're going to be, you're going to be getting personally trained. Nobody, I got no members yet. So it's just you and me. You're, you're paying small group rate, but you're getting one-on-one training until I can figure out marketing. And I don't understand marketing. I'm a gym owner. All I want to do is get you nice and sexy. 
Right. And then you got it. And then you're, you're framing it against personal training, right? Like you told me, Sally, you were paying, you're paying a hundred dollars a session. You never use them. I mean, I'm going to give you the same kind of accountability. It's going to be half price. But then we're going to get somebody else in here. It's going to be your friend and you're going to get a little networking, but you're going to get the same kind of attention because there's never going to be 12 people in this class. Even when we're bursting at the seams, it's going to be you and three friends. And then you got a nice pitch, but I, I'm interested to hear, um, about the gym you, you went to, Teo. Tell me, tell me about it. Well, I dropped into a gym in uh, out in Long Island one one time, and they were an affiliate, but they were renting space. They were essentially renting like a corner of a Globo gym, um, and they only had room for like maximum six people. But to Dan's point, yeah, they weren't charging th- those rates. They were still charging like, you know, 20 bucks a class based on a CrossFit membership rate and and their whole thing was we're going to expand to more space don't worry we're going to open our own gym soon we can have 16 person classes but to john's point they should have just stayed there and just charged more and uh i mean i'm sure they're doing great now but i know that was the whole plan it's just it's an interesting it's interesting that that's everyone's dream but just stay small and charge more i guess you you don't have to yeah yeah, yep. like you don't you don't have like if you want to have a 500 member gym or you want totally, to be totally. Dan Chaffee with 3000 members in Paris 100%. and power to you. I'm just saying mm-hmm. for most people, I would guess it's easier to find success with this model and it's way easier to have a stacked gym of people paying 600 a month and then expand into a group thing where it's like, OK, now it could be 300 if you want than to have. A bunch of people paying you a hundred a month and then try and figure out a way to sell them a three to four hundred dollar a month membership afterward. Yeah. I mean, I think the the challenge is is if you're if you're trying to position yourself as a CrossFit gym. I think that's your rate limiter, right? Because I think what you're talking about is like if I'm gonna open up as like a boutique private training gym, um, then yeah, a hundred percent. I think it would be it would be a more challenging and it would might not be worth the affiliation to have that identity of CrossFit there and then have to justify like, okay, well, we're three times as much as the area gym. But I think if what you're talking about, you did it absent, um, that might be a different story. But some people feel very passionately that it's CrossFit is the thing. It is the way, but like, you know, what is CrossFit? Like literally you go, CrossFit is a fitness program that produces measurable outcomes through lifestyle changes centered on training Mm -hmm. and nutrition. Workouts consist of constantly varied high intensity functional movements and are most fun and effective amongst friends at a local CrossFit gym. I agree with all of those things, but where does it say it has to be 12 friends and can't be three friends? You know, and I understand what you're saying there. You know, you're going to if you say CrossFit because everybody's doing CrossFit the same way, you're going to be pegged to what everyone like the public's perception of CrossFit, which would be a group thing in a warehouse that costs somewhere between a hundred and two hundred dollars a month. And and so I understand you have to fight that stigma. Um right? That's that's kind of what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Gotta, yeah. Um, and and not to say it couldn't be done, but I think you there would be a more strategic way to go about it. I don't disagree. I just think this is uh something I would love to see tested and something I would love to see more of. What if you bought the affiliate name Small Group Personal Training CrossFit? And then you best, could just best small best group small personal group training CrossFit. CrossFit. And in then you city? could just in, <laughs> yeah. who's gonna grab it first? If that name's still available, just grab that name and then it's pretty much in the name. Now you can use the CrossFit name. You can still do CrossFit methodology, but you, your differentiator is very clear. It's CrossFit, awesome. personal, training, CrossFit. CrossFit personal training near me is going to be my affiliate name. <laughs> yeah, I love it. <laughs> there you go. And it's going to rank well. It's going to it's going to it's so going to be high. great. All right. So it sounds like possible, but difficult is what you're telling us. You're, you're, you're peeing on our dreams a little bit, which is fine. So, you know, if you had a mulligan and you were starting from scratch again, like what would you do? How much space would you rent and and what would, would you offer the exact same thing you're offering now or would you um, simplify things a little bit? I'd rent small space, um, you know, uh, yeah, under 2,000 square feet. 
um, you know, well, well under, uh, keep your, if you keep your operating expenses down, then you do have a lot of opportunity to, to, to be patient for that avatar to come in. Um, I would a hundred percent start with a full on consultative process and an on ramp, um, with, with that process in the beginning, if I wanted to do CrossFit classes, I would probably only do two. So one in the morning, one in the evening. Um, as I started to build through with that, with that private training model and things like that. Um, and I would message that the program involves some group fitness and some personalized fitness, um, and, and work through with that. That said, my confidence level of saying, well, I can get one person that has an average revenue of $900 versus I can get, you know, three people that have a res- average revenue per member that 600 is significantly different now than it was five and a half years ago. Right. So having that confidence of like, I'm just going to target this very, very specific population and recognizing I don't need a 10,000 square foot warehouse with decked out and rogue and, and this and that and the other thing with, with an operating expense that's, massive that's going to dictate me to just fill the gym, if you will. Um, I would absolutely start small to allow that. Start small and start with your... I think people, they run right to like, I got to get as many leads as possible instead of just starting conversations with people and then continually talking to those people and doing this organic, organic over and over and over again, being able to recognize like who the person you're really after is would be would be something that I would tell me five and a half years ago. Really niche down as quick as you can. Thanks for lifting up the skirt and and sharing all the secrets with the entire gym world. We we appreciate that. Where um where can people go to find out a little more about you? The where we post the most is uh Woodslawn Fitness on Instagram. Um and then I'm on both Facebook and Instagram uh just to Perrington underscore Woodslawn. Um, I'm, I return DMs as quick as I can. Um, and I'm happy to, what I said the other day is like, I'm happy to share what not to do, what mistakes I've made. Like I'm an open book. I, I'm, I'm happy to share, um, anything or help you problem solve if you need it. So don't hesitate. Tail. I saw your little face there. What um what percentage of our audience do you think is male? I, I know the answer. They they give you these they give you these analytics. Oh, interesting. I would I'm say about this. it's ninety percent, ninety three percent, ninety four percent, ninety nine percent. Not it, anywhere in the ninety percent. What's your What's your guess, uh, Dan? I would. I I'm gonna guess the the same. Um, I would say ninety. You said ninety two. I'm gonna say ninety two. I don't think you said ninety two. I'm gonna pick that one. It's eighty four point five percent. So so we thank uh. you. We thank you for the one point five out of every ten listeners for being female. We appreciate you around here. Um, and, um, you know, tell a female gym owner so we can, we can bump those numbers to, um, you know, 20% yeah. or something. We, we got goals around here too. I love it. So Dan, we appreciate you. Um, we'll link to your stuff down below and, uh, hope you get a lot of mentorship clients from this and, uh, congratulations on your success with your alternative model. Yeah. Thanks so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about this. I really hope that, that people at least think about it, right? And uh, ask questions because it, it's very doable and, and and CrossFit can help a lot of people, but you got to take care of your coaches first. And this, this really helps you do that. So just ask questions. Good night, Jim World. Sweet dreams.